We're continuing to think about total fitness and the different areas of life in which Jesus came to give us life more abundant and to live by the wisdom God gives us. When we um, think about total fitness, we're looking at different areas. We've looked at different dimensions of spiritual fitness and of physical fitness. And now we're going to be looking in particular at financial fitness and then later on get into some more other aspects of flourishing and of living by God's wisdom, intellectual, emotional, relational, and vocational fitness. But for now and in our next few messages, we're going to be thinking about financial fitness. The book of Proverbs says many things about money, as does the rest of the Bible. A couple of the most important Proverbs that really help us get financial fitness in perspective are these contrasts. The house of the righteous contains great treasure, but the income of the wicked brings them trouble. A faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. If your biggest goal in life is financial fitness, understood to be getting more and more money, that's really not being financially fit at all. Because if that's your biggest goal in life, you're eager to get rich, you won't go unpunished, even your income brings you trouble. So there is a way to have a high income and yet be very troubled and not at all financially fit and also to be distressed in various other ways. Again this week, without knowing the history of the individuals involved, we've um, learned of the suicides of two famous people who were on TV or big shots in the fashion world and in the world of cooking and being a very famous chef. But the vast millions that both of them had were certainly not enough for them. So when I think about financial fitness as the Bible talks about it, it's not just a matter of raking in more and more money and having fatter and fatter bank accounts. When God blesses us financially, and it's truly His blessing, then we're going to flourish with that blessing. But if we're trying to pursue wealth without Him, we're not financially fit at all. In thinking about financial fitness, I'm going to um, be focusing, Lord willing, on five different topics. One is, whose money is it? And another message will be about making good money, the process of making money and how that can be a good thing. Money and marriage and how your finances and your life as a family are involved. Um, dealing with debt and dealing with getting out of debt and financial planning. Uh, thinking ahead, investing, insurance, those kinds of things that we have to do with money. And once again, the point is not so that we can become money grubbers who put money over everything else and just follow a health and wealth gospel, but it is a fact that if you can't serve the Lord and love the Lord in your financial life, then a huge chunk of your life is left to the side without giving it over to God. And a huge chunk of the Bible suddenly goes silent because Jesus talked about money almost more than any other topic. The book of Proverbs is filled with references to money, as is the rest of the Bible. So the Bible talks a lot about it. We think a lot about it. And so it's very important that we pay attention to this. And the very first thing to do is answer the question, whose money is it? The Wealth that's in your pocketbook or your billfold. Whose is it? The money that's in your bank account. Whose is it? The stocks or bonds that you may have invested in. Whose is that? Whose stuff is it? We need to be able to answer that question before we can get any further with questions about financial fitness. And... The clear answer of the Bible is that it, it all belongs not to us, but to God. God is the real owner, and we are managing God's money, not our own. There is a difference between being an owner and a manager, or being a steward and a king. A steward may work on behalf of a king, but he should never think he is the king. A manager is working for the owner, not simply for himself. And in our 
I, in our financial dealings, the first question, therefore, that we need to answer simply is, whose money is it? And we need to know that it is God's money, all of it. And as we do that, let's read from our scripture in Chronicles as we hear a prayer of David. The occasion for this prayer is the collection of material and wealth for the building of the temple. David's son Solomon would actually build the temple, but David actually did an awful lot of work bringing together the resources and the finances and the wealth for building that temple. And when they had amassed all of this vast wealth, 600 tons of silver, 300 tons of gold, piles and piles of precious jewels and other valuable materials, when David himself had given enormous amounts and his people had also given vast sums for the building of the temple, then David prayed this prayer. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hand are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have only given you what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. O oh Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. So the theme is I want to praise you, Lord. I'm giving you something, but all of it comes from you. What we as a people are giving you are simply handing back to you things you have given us. There's a story about a missionary who was meeting with the chief of a tribe. And as he was discussing matters with this chief, the chief offered him things. He offered the missionary horses and blankets and jewels. And the missionary said to the chief, but my God does not want your horses and your blankets and your jewels. He wants you. And the chief said, your God is very wise. For if I give myself to him, he gets my horses and my blankets and my jewels. When you ask whose money is it, of course, underneath that lies an even deeper question. Not just does your money belong to God, but do you belong to God? Not just who owns your money, but who owns you? And when you ask that question, the Bible clearly says, well, God owns you. He owns you by right of making you. God owns you by right of creation because your very existence comes from Him. And everything that He made comes from Him. Everything that's in your life. You are God's because He chose you. You're His by right of election. His choice. God said to Israel, you will be my treasured possession because he had chosen them in a special way to be a kingdom and priests to serve him. And the New Testament says that followers of Jesus are chosen to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. We are chosen to be God's as Israel was chosen in a special way. So we're, we're God's by his creative right, by his choice or his election, and we're also his by redemption. God bought you. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So on at least those three grounds, we belong to God. 
And that's why when summarizing the Bible, the Heidelberg Catechism says, what's your only comfort in life and in death? And the very first words in answer to that question are, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has ransomed me from the tyranny of the devil. So the fact that he's paid for us, that I'm not my own, but belong to him, is my great comfort in life and in death. And if you want that to be your comfort, then it also is, in a sense, your responsibility. When it comes to matters of salvation and your eternal destiny, if you want to say, I'm not my own, I belong to God, and I'm so glad I belong to him, and he's taking care of me. Wonderful. You also belong to him in this life, and you belong to him with everything that you have. And so who owns you? Well, God does for reasons of creation and election and redemption. And when you confess, I'm not by my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, you don't just say it, you demonstrate it. And one way you demonstrate it is in the way that you handle your wealth, your income. Tithing is giving 10% of your income to the Lord's work in various ways, whether that's the work of, of a church, whether that's um, work of missionaries, whether that's help of people in need. Tithing is a way of giving to God. And when I read various um, advice books or articles about finances, I find that giving is often a part of the advice they give. And uh, for one reason is that some of the writers are Christians and they know that giving matters. But I've also noticed that for many of these advice um, givers, they have giving as one of the last items that you do. You first get your finances in order. You first get the debts paid off. You first do this and this and that. And then when you have a surplus, you start giving your surplus. That's not quite how the Bible teaches us to handle these matters. It says, start off the top. Just give to God right off the top. In the Old Testament, there was that tithe. The New Testament doesn't emphasize as much the 10% um, amount as what you're called upon to give. Although Jesus does mention, hey, the Pharisees tithed and they should have done a lot more, but that doesn't mean they should have neglected tithing. So uh, even there, Jesus gives his approval to the principle of tithing. Now, tithing shows a number of things. It shows your commitment. When you give 10%, you're showing that you're committed not just to giving God that 10%, but that you're committed to using the other 90% to honor Him and glorify Him as well. When you give first fruits, you're saying that actually all of it's His, and this first fruits that I give is simply a demonstration and a recognition that I want to honor Him with all my wealth. Tithing is a demonstration of thanks. It's showing your appreciation and you're saying, God provides me with more than enough. I can live on 90% of what God gives me. He gives me so much, I can live on 90. I might be able to live on less than that. But I, and so uh, tithing off the top is showing a, a measure of commitment, of thanksgiving that God's been more generous with you than he needed to be. And it's a measure of faith. You're saying, I trust God's future provision rather than hoarding as much as I can. Because once again, if you follow um, certain approaches, you'll say, well, first I have to eliminate debt, then I need to save, then I need to save some more, I need to save for the kids' college fund, I need to save for retirement, I need to invest in this, and I need to save for that. And when I have my surplus, then I will get around to being generous. Well, that's not a tremendous act of faith, is it? When all of a sudden you have a million rattling around in the bank and you decide, now I think I'll start tithing a little bit or giving now that I have it. Now, um, when, you, when you give as, as your first act with your money, you're showing your commitment, you're showing your thanks, you're showing your faith. And when you don't, it's worth asking, what are you showing? Well, are you showing a lack of commitment? Are you saying, 
it's my money to do with what I want, and if I have extra, maybe God will get a little bit of it. Are you saying, I can't possibly live on 90% of what God gives me. God hasn't been generous enough with me. He needs to up my income. Are you saying, you know what? I need to have major stockpiles before I give anything. And that would indicate a lack of faith. So, again, choosing to make giving the first item in your budget is a way of saying God owns everything. And this is the kind of talk that makes some people very uneasy and suspicious, not simply for their own income, but what are the motivations of the person giving this message? I've noticed that if you listen to media evangelists or others, there will often be messages about the importance of tithing and the importance of giving and the wonderful blessings that come from giving. And I will just say here, um, I'm not giving this sermon because the church budget is in trouble. Uh, We're running a surplus. I've never given a sermon in 18 years of the church's life on giving because we were running behind. So the motivation for this is not that, oops, I, I hope next month's paycheck comes through for me, and so please hurry up and give. We're in good shape. The purpose is for the financial fitness of your own life and your own walk with God. If you don't want to give anything to the church, hey, give to something else in God's kingdom. Uh, if you're suspicious of this message, then give to something else. But, but tithe off the top and, and give generously to God because it's so important as an expression of your commitment, your thanks, and your faith. There's um, the principle of tithing off the top or possibly watching it leak out the bottom. I remember... Uh, a couple when we were younger that we knew well in a church that I was involved with, and they were good friends of ours. And they were always in financial difficulty or just on the edge of it. They both had jobs, but they never had enough money. And I happened to know that they had given $20 to the church that year. That's more than I know about any of you because I don't know who gives anything here. The deacons keep track of that. But I knew from them themselves that they had given $20 to the church that year. And when they got a massive tax refund, they immediately spent it on an electronic gadget that they didn't need. They could not possibly afford to give anything to the church with two incomes. And even if they got a tax windfall, they never had anything to give. And over time, they just never did. And he got kind of sick and missed a lot of hours at his job. Their vehicles would break down and more money would go into that, unanticipated expenses. And as things kind of stumbled along, they never had enough. And after a while, they were fighting over money. And years later, their marriage fell apart. Now, I'm not saying their marriage fell apart because they didn't give enough. I am saying that it's a dangerous thing to put everything but God first. Because when you don't have anything to give for God off the top, you may find that your finances and the blessing of those finances just keeps leaking out the bottom of the purse. I'm not making this part up. I'm just kind of uh, pointing to something that's in the Bible itself. The prophet Haggai was speaking to God's people when they were called upon to rebuild the temple years after it had been destroyed. And they weren't doing it because they were building fancy houses for themselves. And so God spoke through the prophet and said, Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You pour it in the top and it goes running out the bottom. The stuff you eat doesn't satisfy you. The clothes you put on aren't keeping you warm. What's wrong? The more you get, the less you have. And then the God goes on to say through Haggai, You expected much, but see, it has turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy 
with his own house. Again, nobody is in the process of rebuilding a temple just now. David's people and his offering was for building a temple. This mention in Haggai of giving or failure to give was related to building a temple. And we're not building a temple. We don't have any housing project or any building projects going on here. Uh, but the principle is, if you're being stingy with God, don't be surprised if there are holes in your purse or holes in your pockets. Now, again, it's not, it's not mechanical where you push God's butt and you give generously and all of a sudden your purse is bursting with money. But it might be. It's not mechanical. But there is a principle that very often when you are not using your wealth, to praise God, God might not trust you with very much wealth. The prophet Malachi has the word of the Lord and says, Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. They say, well, what do you mean return? Did we leave? You ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you because you're robbing me. See, God had commanded Israel, give me a tenth, and they weren't. And God says, you're stealing. You're stealing from me, because it's rightfully mine. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now again, this kind of passage can be misused, so that... You mechanically, if you give something to God, you're expecting him, you're kind of bribing God to give you a whole bunch. But here's a, it, God is saying, hey, test me. If you think that you can't afford to give, try it sometime. <laughs> Just pry your fingers off a few dollars and see what happens. Because God may have great blessings in store once you learn to be generous. Now, when we... Um, talk about giving, I've already mentioned that there's no crisis in the budget and that the church is doing very well financially, so I'm not preaching it for this reason. I'm preaching it because it's part of the Word of God and because each of us um, can benefit. But we need to address the question, does God need our gifts? When the Bible says that we need to be givers, does that mean that God's just in desperate need all the time of our contributions? Well, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He's already got it all. You really can't help him out a whole lot. In, in Haggai, he says, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. It's all his. And so this is very different from the kinds of gods who are worshipped by the pagans. The pagan gods need offerings. Many of the pagan myths have the gods creating humanity so that they would become a food source for the gods, not by the gods eating children, although some of the gods did that too, but by the contributions people would give of food and other things for the upkeep of the gods. Well, God doesn't need that. Why does God um, want our gifts then? Well, not because he needs them, but because he enjoys getting gifts from his children that show our love, even though those gifts are paid for by God's own wealth. Uh, just a quick reminder, next Sunday is Father's Day. Only seven more days, only a few more shopping days for you to get out there and get something really nice for your father. And those of us who are fathers and receive things on Father's Day or receive things on our birthday are in a somewhat interesting position because at least speaking for myself, I'm quite aware that most of the gifts I have received in the past were paid for with my own money. They were paid for with my own money. And so I do not go to the kid and say, thanks a lot, I paid for that, um, because I appreciate their desire to get something for dad, even if they used my money to buy it. That's what's going on when we give to God and God doesn't begrudgingly always say, well, you're just giving me what I paid for anyway. But that is the fact of the matter. That when we offer something to God, what are we offering him that he didn't already give us? But he enjoys getting gifts because they're expressions of the love of his children. 
just as we who are fathers or mothers enjoy getting things from our kids, even if they're using our resources to get it for us. As David said, everything in heaven and earth is yours. Wealth and honor come from you. Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. O oh Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. There is absolutely no question when we ask whose money is it, it's God's. It all comes from him. It all rightfully belongs to him. And that's encouraging also if you don't have a lot of money. The fact that God doesn't need our gifts means that the size of the gift is not necessarily the most important thing. When Jesus was watching givers at the temple one day, he noticed a woman who had almost nothing, but she gave her almost nothing to the Lord. A couple of little coins she dropped in, and Jesus says, you see what she gave? That's the biggest gift here today, because she gave what she had. And the rich people, who gave a lot more money, were giving out of their extra. They were giving their surplus. And God loved that gift because she was pouring herself out in love for the Lord when she gave that gift. And that's why it's encouraging to know that God doesn't actually need our gifts in the sense that he needs it to finance his endeavor. Um, because if it did, then those of us who can only afford to give a relatively small amount because we have a relatively small income, we think, well, what do we count for? You know, there's these multimillionaires. They can write out one check that's bigger than our whole congregation gives in a year. That's true. But that's not how God measures these things. Um, and praise God for Christian multimillionaires. If they happen to write big checks, um, wonderful. But don't say, oh, my giving means nothing because others can give more. The fact is God's going to get his kingdom work done but he enjoys receiving the gifts. Even, you know, a kid who mows the lawn and has ten bucks in your pocket, you give one dollar for God's work. God likes that gift a lot. If you're just a bean counter or an accountant, and you're going to say, well, that one dollar gift from that kid, that means nothing. You know, that's pocket change. Well, not for that kid it isn't. And not for God it isn't. God spoke to people who gave sacrifices and who were sometimes tempted to think their sacrifices bribed him or he needed their sacrifices. And he said, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal on the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. So that, that sentence pretty well settles it. If I was hungry, you think I'd tell you? You know, I can get anything I want because the world and all that's in it is mine. So again, why give to the one who already has everything? Well, again, to demonstrate and deepen your commitment, your thankfulness, and your faith. Remember, we said that giving is an expression of commitment, of thanks, of trust for the future. You give to give your father pleasure. You give to honor him as the owner of all that you have, and in giving first fruits, you're saying, and everything else is yours too, and I'm going to manage that carefully and wisely because it's your money. And simply this, to use your finances to strengthen your walk with God and not pull you away from God. Because as the Bible says, the love of money, putting money first, is the root of all kinds of evil. On the other hand, the management of money for God's honor is one of the great ways to grow closer to God, to enjoy the life that God has given you for his purposes. And when you're managing money in teamwork with God, instead of just seeing money as kind of a dirty thing, but I got some of it and I can use it the way I want, um, you know, even a Christian, if you have that attitude toward money, can start feeling guilty about the money. But when you're managing it and recognizing that God owns it all, then money can get to be kind of spiritually enriching and spiritually fun because now there's a big chunk of your life which formerly just seemed to be outside the sphere of God's relationship with you and now you've brought that into the sphere of relating to God and money's a big part and property is a big part 
of our life in this world and of the stewardship that God gives us. So use it to strengthen your walk with God and not to tug you away from God. Now, there are some people who are very disciplined givers. And they've learned the principles of giving and they are careful to give exactly the right amount. That's not always a guarantee that all is well. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you give a tenth of your spices. So even the littlest stuff, you make sure you give a tenth. Mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter. That is, you, you should have been involved in the big things, the heart things, the, the matters of God's grace in your life and in blessing others. But you shouldn't have neglected the former. So he says the tithing in itself was a good thing, but there are more important things. And giving without the experience of God's grace or the pouring out of God's grace on others, that kind of giving is not the kind of giving God desires. Grace-filled giving is described in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul says of, of a group of Christians, he said, they gave themselves first to the Lord. Remember the story of the chief first had to give himself to the Lord before he gave blankets and horses and jewels. Well, these people gave themselves first to the Lord. And then they gave generously out of what they had. And the apostle says, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. This great, it's a gift to be able to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus gave up the glory and the wealth of heaven to come and provide salvation for us. And when you know that kind of grace, then grace is what you live by, and grace is what you want to pour out into the lives of others. You want to live a life of grace. And so what God pours into your life becomes an occasion to pour into the lives of other people. And that kind of grace-filled giving is satisfying and joyful for a Christian. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So there's this circle of grace where God just keeps pouring his grace into your life, and you keep pouring grace into the lives of others. And one form even that grace takes is God's free financial provision for you so that you in turn can bless his kingdom and bless the needs of others. When you give, just a few things to keep in mind. Giving is meant to be God-centered, and that means you focus on God's grace and on God's glory and not on impressing people. You don't give to get your name etched on a building or to get a special seat engraved with your name on it or get a brick in the building with your name. I know all this stuff is out there as fundraising methods. I don't like it um, because I don't think the Bible encourages it. You want to give because you want to glorify God and bless his name and minister to others. Be generous. Gladly give to bless others and not to get something from them. Again, many companies and corporations, I think they give to be seen giving. It may not be their only reason, but they sure want it to be known. You know, some companies on TV who give to a scholarship, they say, we're going to give $1,000 in the name of this athlete as the best player of the game for a scholarship. It costs them a million in airtime to talk about that thousand they're giving. Okay? <laughs> they're giving for the purpose of being known as generous, and that kind of defeats the purpose. And here's another one, be wise. In your giving budget, plan the amounts you're going to give and the timing of your gifts. And not just spur of the moment. Boy, I, sometimes a spontaneous gift is great if you see a need or something comes across your path. But the Bible does encourage, hey, on the first day of the week, set a certain amount aside and bring it. And plan it. And when you're giving to particular ministries or organizations, make sure you know what they're up to as much as you can or have people whom you trust that keep an eye on them, require transparency and integrity from the organizations you support. Because there are many, many organizations that can speak very persuasively or tell a heart-tugging story about what they're up to, and you whip out your checkbook. But you don't know very much about them except how good their fundraisers are. 
And be a little aware, be aware of this too. Um, sometimes you, and you know, I know that it happens among charities, probably even some of the ones I've worked for, where you have the emergency appeal that if you don't give, and if you don't give now, we need that money now for this great need. And it might be $10,000, $20,000, whatever. And of course, you might not be able to write out a check for that amount, but, but it's an emergency and it has to happen now or something catastrophic is going to happen. When I see that appeal, I say, hmm, that's probably an organization that's not very good at managing money. Because almost any organization would have 10 or 20,000 lying around for an emergency contingency. And if they don't have that, they must be very bad at planning. I think I'll support an organization that knows how to plan. So again, I, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just saying that these are often methods of fundraising that push your buttons without telling you actually how prudently or wisely they're using your money for the Lord's purposes. So be God-centered, be generous, and use your head. Uh, find out about the ministries you invest in. And don't feel, once you've made a choice, hey, I'm giving to God off the top. Here's how much I have to give. Here are the ministries I'm going to divide it up among. Then don't feel guilty every time you hear another appeal and you don't have anything to give for it. You gave what you could. You gave what you planned. And you knew you gave it for a good cause. And there may be other good causes. You can't fund them all. So once you've been wise about it and planned carefully, then you can give with a free conscience. And you can spend what the Lord wants you to use for yourself with a free conscience. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. That's the general principle of Proverbs, that when you honor God with your wealth, God will take care of you. He'll provide you with wealth. You're responsible, then, to honor God with all your money, not just the money you give to church missions and charity. I want you to get that point. You don't say, okay, the 10% was God's. I gave that now. I don't have to think about the rest. No. Thank God for every dollar you spend or every dollar you're able to save or every dollar you're able to provide for your children's needs with or every dollar that you can enjoy something good with and honor God with all of your money. Here's another important thing to realize about managing God's money. If you see your money as God's, I have good news for you. Your money problems become God's too. If you honor God with your money and you see all of your money as God's, then if you've got money problems, hey, they're his problem. Now, that's not to say that if you've been really bad at saving or done really dumb stuff with your money, you don't need to smarten up. But if you're having money problems and you actually see it all as God's money, it does change your perspective when you say, Lord, I'm going to stop worrying about it so terribly much and say, Lord, it's not just that I have a problem. You've got a problem. So either help me to be a wiser spender and make do with the resources I have, or give me more, please. But um, my money problems are your problem because it's your money. And a, a final thing to keep in mind is this. If you accept that God owns everything of yours, well, then it turns out that you own everything of God's. That may sound like an overstatement, but I will substantiate it from the Bible. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? All things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. God likes relationship. And when you're in relationship with him, he claims everything you've got. But he doesn't just do that. He gives you everything He's got. He's withheld nothing, and he will withhold nothing that is for your good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that all we have comes from your hand, that every good and perfect gift comes from above, whether it's finance, whether it's the supreme gift of your own son, it's all rightfully yours and has generously been given to us. And so, Lord, help us to be stewards, people who know that we're not the owners of anything, but the managers of what you've given. And at the same time, then help us to know that we are sons and heirs, and that actually everything you have is entrusted to us and will someday be ours. And so help us, Lord, to be faithful in small things until that day when we're charged with even greater riches. 
Bless each one here, Lord. You know the struggles that some have with finances, with making ends meet. Some, Lord, are just needing more provision, and so give it to them. Others need more wisdom in what you are giving them, so give them that wisdom that they can manage it well. And many of us, Lord, have all that we need and much more besides. Thank you, Lord, for those who have been prospered in that way. Thank you for the way they've been generous to in supporting the work of the kingdom and the church and help them to find joy and satisfaction in doing that. May each of us, Lord, set our hearts on you, that we not just have treasure on earth, but supremely set our hearts on treasure in heaven for Jesus' sake.